Dear students, the next lecture is about the uh, gross anatomy of the trachea and the lungs. Uh, last time uh, we mentioned the gross anatomy of the larynx and it continues in the lower airways, in the rest of the lower airways, in the trachea, which is extended between the sixth cervical and the fourth thoracic vertebrae, it's quite important uh, data. And uh, then the distal part is just called the bronchus tree. Uh, the trachea, in cross-section, you see this in this uh, picture, uh, the trachea has two parts. Uh, it has a cartilaginous wall, uh, this is a hyaline cartilage, and it has a membranous wall, which uh, contains smooth muscle elements. Uh, the trachea divides into two main or principal bronchi at the level of the fourth thoracic vertebra, this is very important. Uh, the right one, as you see this in this schematic drawing, is uh, more vertical, uh, longer, I mean, sorry, shorter and wider than the left one. That's why the foreign objects uh, will be entrapped mostly on the right side, in the right principal bronchus. So this is more vertical, wider and shorter than the left. From above, we see a quite nice uh, edge. This is called carina. And uh, this, in this case, this is the right uh, bronchus, uh, more vertically, and this oblique one is the left principal bronchus. The uh, trachea, after the first division, uh, divides into uh, lower bronchi. Uh, here you see some. And then the next is the tertiary bronchus, or segmental bronchus. These are labeled with different colors. So, uh, we have uh, approximately 22, 24 divisions, I can tell you ahead. That's why we are very proximal still. Uh, the topography of the uh, main bronchus is very important. On the right side, as you see this in this picture, it is surrounded by this vein, the zygos vein. We will study this later in the posterior mediastinum. On the left side, uh, the left bro uh, main bronchus is surrounded by the aortic arch especially the left one is important because in some cases uh, lung cancer can invade into the aorta causing fatal bleeding. So it can be important in the clinical practice. So we have principal or main bronchi, these are the primary bronchi. We have lower bronchi, these are the secondary bronchi. And we have segmental bronchi, which are called also tertiary bronchi. If we watch the uh, topography of the lung, uh, after the removal of the anterior surface of the thoracic cage, you see that the two lungs uh, uh, fill uh, the most of the uh, cavity, but between them uh, we see a small appearance of the uh, uh, heart and the uh, pericardiac sac. Uh, uh, together with the uh, thoracic cage wall, the parietal layer of the serous membrane, which covers the pleura, which covers the lung, uh, is also removed. That's why we see directly the lungs. But here, this pale uh, layer would be the reflected part of the parietal pleura, which covers the diaphragm. The diaphragm is in brown. Uh, if we remove a bit the, uh, the lungs, then you see much better the extension of the pericardiac sac uh, together with the heart. Above, we see uh, large vessels, what we study later, together with the Oedipus remnant of the thymus, we see this in histo. Uh, this is also called retrosternal fat bed. If we go a little bit deeper in a frontal cut, uh, what I want to highlight is the very thin separation between the thoracic and the abdominal organs. So that's why common wound can hurt several organs, uh, a gunshot, for example, including the lung, the heart, the liver, and especially on the left side, the stomach as well. This is a more superficial, this is more posterior uh, picture. Uh, both are in frontal cut, as I mentioned. So the liver is very close to the uh, right, but also partly to the left lung, and also uh, the stomach. So the diaphragm is a relatively thin layer, which separates them. Uh, regarding the uh, uh, structures of the lung, uh, we have apex on both sides, so these are the tips, and we have a wider, lower part called the base on both sides. Uh, the right one 
can be divided into three lobes. That is an important difference because on the left we have only two. So uh, we have two fissures which create three lobes. The upper is the horizontal fissure, the lower one is the oblique fissure, and this way we have superior lobe, middle lobe, and inferior lobe. On the left side we have only one, the oblique fissure, and this way we have superior and inferior lobe only. Uh, what we see is the so-called costal surface. In some cases, especially in the real preparation, we are able to see the uh, corresponding impressions what the uh, ribs made, so the so-called costal impressions. This is not so uh, uh, visible in this case. Uh, but we have two other surfaces. One is below uh, the uh, inferior surface, or called a diaphragmatic surface, because this is resting on the uh, dome of the uh, diaphragm. And uh, we have a so-called mediastinal or medial surface, which is not visible now, but on the next uh, slide it will be seen. Uh, we have two margins on both uh, lungs. We have the anterior margin and inferiorly the inferior margin. On the left side, I like to highlight this notch, this uh, uh, indentation, uh, which is uh, made by the heart. That's why it's called cardiac notch. And there is a little process, uh, tongue-like process. That's why I got the name as lingula. This is missing on the right side. If we see the previously mentioned medial or mediastinal surface, we are able to see the helum of the lung with the very important structures. But if you look at the color codes and the abbreviations, this is a bit different. So this is how you are able to distinguish from this aspect uh, between uh, the right and left uh, lungs. So in case of the right one, the upper is the uh, principal bronchus. Uh, in uh, many cases, uh, this starts to divide already, so we can see even two cross-sections of the principal bronchus. Uh, it means we have already lobar bronchi in this case. And we have, the, so that's why DB is the uppermost in this abbreviation, BAV, uh, so principal bronchus in this case. Second is the pulmonary artery, and the third is the pulmonary vein uh, with V, A, artery, V, vein. The colors are not mistakes, so uh, it shows the uh, quality of the uh, blood, what these vessels carry. The artery carries the deoxygenated blood from the heart to the uh, lung, to the site of the gas exchange, and the returning oxygenated, refreshed blood is carried by the pulmonary veins back to the heart. So that's why these are labeled uh, this way, but in some atlases, the uh, traditional colors are used, so arteries are red, the veins are blue, so you have to be careful to interpret these uh, structures here. So BAV is the order on the right side. On the left side, the first two are the opposite. First, we have the pulmonary artery, again in blue. The next is the pr uh, principal uh, bronchus, and we have uh, some pulmonary veins in red. These may vary in, in, in uh, uh, position, so can be even quite high. Uh, you see something, a reflection of a serous membrane around the hilum, uh, and this is a reflection between the uh, visceral layer of the pleura, which covers the surface of the lung quite tightly, and the parietal layer of the pleura, which is missing from the picture. This transition line is the root of the lung, including the structures of the hilum, and this continues as duplicate downward to the diaphragm, and this is called pulmonary ligament. So the uh, pulmonary root and the pulmonary ligaments are the transitions between the visceral and the parietal pleural layers. This is what you see uh, on the med medial or mediastinal surfaces. You see on both sides the impression for the heart, so cardiac impression, especially on the left side, it's logic. Logical. It's uh, deeper than the right, but it's also present on the right side. And we have quite big groove behind uh, the left uh, pulmonary helum. This is for the aorta, groove for the aorta, and uh, this is for the descending part of the uh, thoracic aorta, and this is the aortic arch here. And what I didn't label, there's a groove upward. This is the third branch of the aortic arch, uh, the left subclavian artery, so th this is the corresponding groove. On the right side, we don't see so big a groove behind, 
only a thin groove. This is where the oozygous vein is present, so that's why groove for the oozygous vein. And we will study that it empties into the superior vena cava, so that's why it has a corresponding groove for the superior vena cava. Uh, on the left side, this is the cardiac notch, previously mentioned, and this returning part is the lingula. Uh, after the medial or mediastinal surface, we see the diaphragmatic surface in both cases, nothing special found on this. These are resting, as I told you, uh, on the dome of the diaphragm. <coughs> diaphragm. The next unit after the lobes would be the bronchopulmonary segment. This is a pyramidal shaped segment unit. Uh, the tip is facing to the hilum, the base is on the surface. We have 10 or 9 to 10 uh, segments in the lung. And we have to know the structures, how uh, they are ordered, they are how positioned in the uh, uh, segment. The corresponding uh, so-called segmental bronchus enters through the tip of the uh, uh, segment and runs in the axis and divides into several divisions. I told you altogether we have 22, 24 generations of the bronchus tree, so we have lots of uh, distally. So this is in the axis. It is followed, followed by the, the pulmonary uh, artery in blue. And uh, uh, we don't see here, but the bronchus tree has its own blood supply, what I want to highlight later. Uh, this is different. And these are called bronchial vessels, bronchial arteries and veins. These are also together with the bronchus tree, uh, logically. And the only vessel which returns uh, the, uh, at the periphery of the uh, segment is the uh, pulmonary vein. This is seen in red, of course, the corresponding uh, uh, segmental branch. Uh, we have some nerve fibers, I mean vegetative fibers along the bronchus tree. We have lymphatic vessels along the bronchus tree. That is another story. Altogether, as I told you, we have 10 uh, segments on the right side, three in the superior uh, lobe, two in the middle, and five in the uh, inferior lobe. On the left side, we have nine rather than 10, uh, five in the superior, and four or five in the inferior lobe. Uh, these are separated from each other, I mean the segments, uh, by connective tissue septae. So these are uh, removable uh, separately from the others that is important for the surgeons. Uh, if we follow the uh, distal part of the bronchus tree, I will describe this later with details in histo lecture. But here you see that we are here, that is the tertiary bronchus or segmental bronchus. We have several divisions from 4th to 11th division, uh, which are called sub-segmental bronchus, or bronchus simply. And not labeled, but we have the last part of the bronchus with uh, cartilage. This will be the 12th division, <coughs> the so-called terminal bronchus. And this delay, we have just bronchioles. And uh, the bronchioles do not have cartilage anymore. And uh, we have several uh, divisions. What we see is the terminal bronchiole. This is the 18th division of the uh, bronchus tree. And the corresponding unit distally is the secondary lobule. If we follow this uh, more distally with a larger magnification, where we see these humps on the wall, these are the uh, alveoli already. Uh, this is the so-called respiratory bronchiole. And uh, the corresponding unit is the asinus. And finally, the uh, so-called alveolar duct, which opens up into the alveoli, is uh, the so-called uh, primary uh, lobule. This is used in the clinical practice. That's why, that's why I introduced uh, in the lecture. Uh, uh, so the uh, segments are separated from each other by connective tissue septae, and these are seen otherwise in different color codes. And as I mentioned, uh, we have the uh, corresponding part of the bronchus, the tertiary bronchus or segmental bronchus, which enters in the tip. And it is associated by its own blood supply. These smaller vessels are the bronchial vessels with the corresponding nerves and lymph vessels. And the major uh, vessel, which uh, is also associated to the bronchus, is the uh, pulmonary artery in blue. What I want to highlight it capillarizes only at the level of the alveoli, so very distally, and the oxygen blood is carried by the pulmonary veins 
with the corresponding uh, segmental branches, of course, uh, at the periphery, so in the intersegmental connective tissue septae. Uh, here I like to highlight the two big uh, circulations. So the lung is a very special organ from this aspect because it has two distinct circulations. One is the so-called functional circulation, which is useful for the whole body. And this is also called lesser circulation. This is related to the gas exchange. That's why it's important for the whole body. It starts from the right ventricle. We, start, uh, we study later in the heart. Then uh, we have the so-called pulmonary trunk, not labeled, which divides into pulmonary arteries. We have a right and left one. This carries deoxygenated blood. That's why it's labeled in blue in my case. Then the capillaries is found at the level of the alveoli only. Uh, this is uh, the site of the gas exchange. And the, the, the oxygenated blood uh, after the gas exchange is carried by the pulmonary veins. That's why it's red. And it returns to the left atrium. This is very important later uh, when we study the heart as well. The nutritive circulation is the other circulation, the nourishment of the given organ, and it is related to the bronchial vessels. These are in the regular colors. The bronchial arteries carry the oxygenated blood uh, to the uh, bronchus three uh, uh, layers, cells. These are originated mostly from the uh, thoracic aorta, but some parts are also from the internal thoracic artery. The capillaries is found along the whole bronchus tree, with the exception of the distal most part, because they receive oxygen directly from the air. They don't need blood supply there. And the returning veins are the bronchial veins. These are not labeled here. And they are drained to the zygous or hemizygous veins. Uh, they may have an astomus with the pulmonary veins, but the quality of the blood from the bronchial veins, I mean the quantity of the blood uh, from the bronchial veins don't disturb the oxygenated blood in the pulmonary vein. <clears throat> Here you see the black arrows, how the blood flow is in the functional circulation. <clears throat> and uh, the next topic is related to the compartments of the thoracic uh, cavity. As you see with two uh, light uh, blue or violet, this, uh, these are the two pleural sacs containing the lungs. And between them we have uh, uh, with red the pericardial sac uh, with the heart. <clears throat> so, if I want to simplify, I would mention that we have a compartment in the middle uh, between the two pleural sacs, uh, between the two parietal pleurae, and uh, this part will be called mediastinal part, but this is the mediastinum, this compartment. Here, only the heart with the uh, serous membrane, pericardium, is labeled, but it extends until the vertebrae. Uh, so the whole will be called mediastinum. Uh, in this uh, figure, this is a schematic drawing, uh, I like to explain this with more details. The green in this case is the so-called parietal pleura, which is attached to the uh, surrounding uh, uh, wall uh, structures, the uh, ribs, for example, or uh, the diaphragm below. Uh, this is in green, and it has three parts. We have the costal part, we have the diaphragmatic part, and we have the mediastinal part facing medially in both cases. That's why now I use another term. The mediastinum, the remaining space or compartment, uh, is between the two medias mediastinal parts of the parietal pleura. Or you can say just simply between the two pleural sacs, that is also good. So this is the mediastinum. Uh, in a horizontal cut, you see <clears throat> another uh, important uh, 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 structure, the reflection between the black and green. The black would be the visceral pleura, which is tightly on the surface of the lung. The green is the previously mentioned parietal pleura, <clears throat> and, they, and they are reflected into each other around the helum of the lung. This is the root of the lung and also in the pulmonary ligament, and it separates this remaining compartment, so the mediastinum, into anterior and posterior part. But if you watch this, uh, and this is, let's say, the anterior mediastinum, here in the lower part we have the cardiac, the heart, so this is the cardiac mediastinum, and above we have the large vessels, the supracardiac mediastinum. These are all separate questions, and then the posterior part is the posterior mediastinum, as I told you. <clears throat> On this picture, you can see also important uh, uh, 
uh, anatomical terms. Uh, these reflections between the two different parts of the green, so between the costal part and the diaphragm part of the parietal pleura, these are called recesses. In this case, this is the phrenico costal or costo diaphragmatic recess. We have a, a smaller recess here between the mediastinal part of the parietal pleura and the diaphragmatic part of the parietal pleura. That's why it's called a phrenico mediastinal recess. So in a frontal cut, we see two recesses on each side. The most famous is the costo diaphragmatic or phrenico costal recess. This is the deepest point of the pleural cavity. That's why this is the uh, site in the uh, serous membrane cavity where fluid can be settled in case of inflammations or bleedings or uh, metastasis, let's say. <clears throat> and otherwise, it has a physiological role as well. If you look at my drawing, uh, this red is the diaphragm under the lungs. And in case of inspiration, the lung lowers. Uh, this interrupted line shows this position carrying uh, the green line, which was continuous in the resting phase, and will be interrupted in the inspiration. So this way, this tiny angle opens up, and this allows the lung to expand into this in inspiration. So this is the physiological role of these recesses, and the most important, again, the phrenico-costal or costo-diaphragmatic recess. <clears throat> the third recess is seen in a horizontal cut, uh, this is the costal part of the parietal pleura, this is the mediastinal part of the parietal pleura, and this angle in front is the costal mediastinal recess. So these three pairs of recesses should be known, but especially the costal diaphragmatic recess. Again, these recesses are between the different parts of the parietal pleura only. The reflection between the uh, visceral and parietal, so the black and green, would be found around the uh, helum. As pulmonary root and pulmonary ligament, so different story. <clears throat> Normally, we have otherwise just a very small virtual space between the parietal and visceral pleural layers with some fluid, with the exception of this little recess. Uh, we have to know, when we describe an organ, the relationship to the given skeletal elements in this case uh, to the uh, ribs, but when we study the abdominal organs, uh, we will mention the vertebral column. And this kind of uh, description is the so-called skeletotopy of the given organ. Skeletotopy, the relation uh, of the organ to the uh, uh, skeletal elements. We have the syntopy as well, when, we, when uh, you have to know the other organs, which are uh, in close vicinity with the given organ, what we uh, study. Uh, now, the skeletotopy. This is important for the clinical practice as well, because we have to auscultate the lungs, uh, the heart, and we have to be able to uh, use percussion to uh, determine the normal uh, border of the lung, for example, or maybe fluid is settled in this uh, recess. That's why we have to uh, know normally the uh, healthy positions. Uh, before I uh, describe these numbers, I'd like to uh, explain something. Here the uh, black one shows the parietal pleura, the lower one, the, in blue, and I put it in bracket in red, the uh, projection of the uh, visceral pleura on the anterior surface. But what are these black lines? These are those planes what we use for the descriptions. We have the so-called parasternal plane, which is along the uh, lateral border of the sternum. We have the midclavicular plane, which helps the clavicle. We have the midaxillary, which is a virtual line, uh, because we studied just the anterior and the posterior axillary folds, and this is between them. And if I turn to the posterior side, from behind we see again the midaxillary, then the scapular line, which passes through the inferior angle of the scapula, and at the end the paravertebral line, which follows the lateral margin of the vertebral column. So we use these vertical planes or, uh, or axes for uh, descriptions because, as you see, due to the oblique course of the uh, ribs, they will uh, cross uh, uh, in these planes different, uh, you know, ribs number, rib number numbers. Sorry. 
Now, back to the uh, uh, anterior surface. Uh, I'd like to tell you something, that the tip of the lung, together with the cupola of the pleura, that is the highest point of the pleural sac, uh, uh, it, uh, they extend over the clavicle one to two centimeters. And that's why if somebody has a wound on the neck, uh, you may hurt, uh, I mean, the, the lungs may be hurt. Uh, I know uh, an accident, I mean it's a crime basically, when a lady was uh, attacked by a, a guy uh, in a Hungarian city and uh, the guy stabbed uh, the neck of the uh, woman and she was lucky because her goiter uh, protected the large vessels on the neck, so no any bleeding was uh, observed, but she got PTX pneumothorax because uh, the guy stopped the tip of the lung, so this way air entered and uh, the lungs uh, collapsed. So this is the pneumothorax. Uh, she survived, but this was an uh, interesting anatomical uh, background for these injuries. Anyway, so this is what you have to know. The tip of the lung together with the uh, cupola of the pleura uh, uh, are located one to two centimeters above the clavicle. Where? somewhere between the midclavicular and the parasternal plane in the middle. Now then, if we follow both the uh, medial margin of the lung and the medial uh, margin of the parietal pleura, both converge and they will be the closest at the level of the second rib. How do we know that uh, we are here? Uh, maybe you remember that we studied in the first semester that on the anterior surface of the uh, thoracic cage, the best landmark for orientation is the sternal angle. Between the manubrium and the body of the uh, sternum, we have a, a little angle uh, facing forward, and you can palpate this, and the second rib is attached, uh, joints to this uh, uh, angle. That's why we know if we can palpate this uh, protrusion, if we go laterally, this is the second rib, under the corresponding second intercostal space, then the third rib, then the third intercostal space, and so on. So, uh, this is what we use for orientation in front. Posteriorly, on the back, we use uh, the so-called vertebra prominence, which is the seventh thoracic, uh, cervical vertebra, cervical vertebra, with quite huge uh, spinous uh, process, and it's easy to palpate. And then the next is the first thoracic vertebra with the related ribs, and that's why we are able to count the ribs uh, on the back. But in front, let's go back to this. So we were at the level of the second rib. And on the right side, we have to draw a line in the parasternal line, simply vertically. In case of the lung, until the sixth rib. In case of the parietal pleura, to the seventh rib. That's why we have a difference here. And when we go to the midclavicular plane, uh, the parietal pleura still uh, follows the seventh, the lung, the sixth rib. Then when we go to the mid axillary line, uh, we have difference, ninth uh, rib in case of the parietal pleura, eighth rib in case of the visceral pleura, which means the surface of the lung. This is otherwise the biggest difference between these two, and uh, this is the deepest point of the whole pleural sac, called costo-diaphragmatic recess, as we mentioned earlier, and this is the most common site of the settlement of fluid. Uh, I think I mentioned everything on the left side, we have a little difference. Uh, from second, we have to draw a line to the fourth in both cases, uh, lung and the parietal pleura. And then, from between the fourth and sixth, we have an indentation. In case of the lung is deeper, this corresponds to the cardiac notch, and the uh, parietal pleura is also some, but not so deep, as the lung has together with this visceral pleura. And this is the previously mentioned lingula, which starts to return. So, otherwise, uh, basically the same ribs will be crossed uh, by the uh, uh, inferior surface of the lung and the parietal pleura on the left side as well. <coughs> That's why I didn't show the difference. From a posterior aspect, uh, you see that uh, the scapular line uh, is uh, through the inferior angle of the scapula, and in case of the lung, uh, it uh, crosses uh, in this uh, scapular line the 10th rib, the uh, parietal pleura the 11th rib, and uh, the uh, paravertebral line is the last one. Uh, the lung grows to the 11th, the 
parietal uh, pleural to the 12th rib. So here we see again the, the previously mentioned costal diaphragmatic recess, uh, which is the deepest point of the whole uh, pleural sac, and that's why this can be filled with fluid, which blocks you know, the expansion, expansion of the lung. This is what we can uh, test with percussion. Uh, <clears throat> some uh, statements and descriptions about the mechanism of the inspiration, uh, otherwise the recesses are labeled here. So we have a only a virtual space between the uh, parietal and visceral layers of the pleura. Uh, the parietal pleura is tightly attached to the endothoracic fascia, which is the inner uh, fascia lining of the thoracic cage, and uh, uh, the uh, visceral pleura is attached to the parietal with a few drops of serous fluid. And that's why when the parietal pleura moves together with the uh, costal, uh, so the uh, thoracic cage, or with the diaphragm, uh, the visceral pleura also, because of this uh, adhesion, and I mean fluid like adhesion, and it creates a vacuum because the pressure is lower than the uh, environmental air, and that's why the air can enter. Now, uh, the major component uh, regarding the muscles is the diaphragm, which lowers. This is the resting, this is the uh, uh, position of the diaphragm in inspiration. And uh, when the diaphragm lowers, uh, it uh, compresses the abdominal organs and, and uh, pushes the, them uh, forward because anteriorly the abdominal wall is flexible until a certain degree at least. When uh, no uh, mobility anymore, then the uh, uh, diaphragm starts to resting on the organs, but the peripheral part still continues the contraction and that's why it start to elevate the ribs. Uh, the intercostal muscles uh, are rather for the uh, stiffening of the uh, uh, thoracic wall, so not uh, really for elevation as we teach them. Originally we mentioned that for external, uh, the, for inhalation the external intercostal muscles are active, and the internal and the intimus, uh, or innermost, uh, this is the English nomenclature, uh, intercostal muscles are used only the forced ex uh, exhalation, uh, expiration. Normally, for the normal uh, expiration, we use only uh, the recoil of the elastic elements, so we don't need muscle components. But in some cases, when we have blockade, for example, in the airways, uh, we use muscles for this purpose, and then we use the internal or innermost intercostal muscles. <clears throat> uh, this, is, uh, this was mentioned in the first semester because of the special course of the ribs. Uh, if you remember, we have two interesting types of uh, movements with the elevation of the ribs. We have a so-called pump handle movement. This is the resting position of the rib, and with the inspiration, uh, with the elevation of the ribs, uh, the sternum moves forward a bit, so this way the uh, sagittal axis increases in size. And this is uh, from a posterior view, the other, the, other, the so-called bucket handle movement, this is the resting position of the rib margins, and after the elevation, they increase the transverse uh, axis of the thoracic cage. The, but don't forget, the major component is the diaphragm, which increases the, the volume vertically. At the end, I like to add the muscles. So we have principal muscles for the uh, inspiration, the diaphragm, and some degree of the external intercostals. The new concept is the diaphragm is for the uh, uh, elevation of the ribs and also lowering, of course, uh, and increasing the vertical part or axis of the uh, thoracic cage and the external intercostals just for the stiffening of the ribs. It's another story, but you can mention that these are also for inhalation. And we have some accessory muscles which are attached with one end to the ribs and that's why they are ab able to elevate the ribs. What are these? Sternocleidomastoid and the scalene muscles, anterior, middle, and posterior. We will study them in the third semester. But we study in the first, uh, in the uh, first semester, we studied a few muscles which are also related to the thoracic cage, uh, the serratus anterior, uh, 
the uh, pectoris major and minor, for example, if you remember, these are also attached to the ribs. And if we, for example, stabilize the other end of the muscle, which is on the humerus, then, uh, or, uh, yeah, on the humerus or on the scapula, then um, we are able to elevate these muscles. On this side, uh, you see that in normal uh, expiration, we don't need muscular elements, only the recoil of the elastic elements. But in forced expiration, we may use muscles, then the internal and innermost uh, intercostal muscles are used, and some abdominal muscles as well, what you studied also in the first semester. Thank you very much for your attention.